Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday worship, not on the lawn. <laughs> it's so great to see you all here. Uh, I'm delighted to be worshiping with you from here, just as much as I am always delighted to worship with you as I sit in the pews with you. This is a special way of uh, worshiping together. Uh, if any of you don't know me, I'm Bob Cabanas, and I'm subbing in for Reverend Yolp, who is on vacation this week. He'll be back next week, and uh, we'll be able to worship with him. I uh, have a, an announcement, one or two announcements, one for sure. Uh, no slides today. Our projector is ill. <laughs> it's unwell, and so therefore we're going old school today, and we're using the bulletin. So uh, just take yourself back in time to a few years before when we didn't have that, and we'll, we'll still worship in that way. And everything you need to uh, know for following along and the responsive readings and so on is in your bulletin, so that will work well. As I mentioned last Sunday, no communion in September, but we will have communion in October. Are there any other announcements? I know Nancy has one. And Janet. There we go. Good morning. Um, I, just a heads up for um, next week is Baptism Sunday, and uh, we will have, hopefully, uh, a gang of boys here to be baptized. Uh, I, I, I'm still looking for some help. If you, have, if you could uh, lend a hand with these eight bouncy boys, and uh, one, I'm sure, unruly adult. So uh, if you could see me after church, that would be fine. Thank you. Before I make my announcement, uh, there is one other thing that is broken again in the church, and that is the um, copy of, so that's why there's no bulletins today. So anyway, we have finished our call out for picture taking. It starts tomorrow, and Monday and Tuesdays, uh, portrait takers, uh, picture people, uh, should have been notified, and I believe they were. And uh, the other Wednesday and Thursday will be notified in the next day or two. So if anyone else would like to have the shot taken, please um, see me after church. I do have to leave fairly early, but I'll be here for a couple minutes. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> Cody has found a, a small number of bulletins, so if, if there's... Uh, or maybe that was the previous week. Was that the previous week? No. Bulletins? No. If there's a few around, maybe we could share them or something. There's, there's some at the back. There. There's some at the back, if anybody. And if, if not, then the responsive words I'll say anyway, so we'll still have it recorded at least. And it'll, all, it'll all work out. We are worshiping today on the traditional lands of the indigenous peoples with whom Treaty 7 was signed. The Siksika, Kainai, Pikani, Stony Nakoda, and our very close neighbors, the Sutina nations. We recognize our responsibility as signatories to that treaty to live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. We gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, members of God's family and brothers and sisters to one another. There are no outsiders here among us. No one has any special standing or bragging rights. We've been brought together as one family of faith by the redeeming love of Jesus. God brought us here. We have come to sing God's praises we have come to hear God's word. We have come to offer our prayers to God. We have come to worship. 
Please stand as we sing our opening hymn. you to be seated. The skylight is open. We're, we gather in the light of a new day. This candle, the Christ candle, serves as a symbol of the light that we seek within ourselves and within others. And would you pray with me the opening prayer that is printed in your bulletins. Creator God, keeper of heaven and earth, we have come to this place seeking you. Each of us has our reason for being here. You know our hearts, you know our needs. We call on your spirit to descend on us now. May our time together during this sacred hour be a blessing, and may we leave this place changed. Amen. Please remain seated for the singing of the next hymn.
You know, um, I, I really love worshiping on the lawn and the lawn chairs and all. But you know what? It feels good to be here too. And just from where I am, I hear these beautiful voices and, and this amazing accompaniment and I really get a sense that God is here and it feels good. As we prepare our hearts and minds to hear the sacred text, let's pray. Patient God, you know that it is our intent to give you our undivided attention. In silence, we coax our bodies to relax, listening only to the sound of our breath. May our hearts be opened to a clear understanding of the message in the ancient texts we are about to hear. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes again from the book of Exodus. Last week we heard about Moses having an encounter with God who spoke from a burning bush. God instructed Moses to go to Egypt where the Israelites were being held in slavery. Once there, God will help Moses bring them safely out of slavery to a land flowing with milk and honey. The 12th chapter of Exodus finds Moses and his brother Aaron in Egypt, where God speaks to Moses again. God has planned to execute judgments on all of the gods of Egypt and to strike down every firstborn in that land. God outlines a plan that will keep the enslaved Israelites safe from destruction. The ritual that God instructs the Israelites to perform establishes a festival that is celebrated to this day. It's interesting to note that this festival is established without need of a priest or ordained official religious leader. Rather, it is established as a family celebration rooted in the home. First reading this morning is Exodus 12, verses 1 to 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall then be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the lamb the same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover over of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night And I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. 
This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe as a perpetual ordinance. There you have it, the origins of the festival of Passover. The Jewish followers of Jesus in the first century Rome must have wondered how they could adhere to the old Jewish laws and established traditions while at the same time follow Jesus. After all, Jesus had proclaimed some pretty radical ideas. One couldn't blame them for being confused. Questions might have arisen like, does following Jesus and this new movement mean that existing Jewish laws no longer apply? Some of Paul's writings to the house churches in Rome seem to make an attempt at addressing some of their concerns. Listen to what Paul has to say in this chapter. The epistle passage is Romans 13, verses 8 to 14. Love for one another. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summoned up in this word, Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery or litigiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Thank you, Elizabeth. And may God add his blessing to the readings of those portions of ancient scripture. Our next song is going to be around, so it says in the bulletin solo. I'm going to ask Cody if he'll help us. Please turn to number 14 this. in your more voices. Yeah, more voices. And if you are on the you're the left, you're going to follow Beth. And if you're on the right, you're going to follow Elizabeth. And But for right now, let's sing it together, and then I'll give you some further instructions. Let's sing it together. So this is a canon. We're going to start overlapping it. And uh, here's how it's going to work. We're going to sing it together like we just did one time. And then we're going to um, start it over in canon. So we'll sing it all together once. And then we're going to go in two parts. Start, and this side will start with Beth. And then the second side will start with Elizabeth. When we do that, we're going to sing it through twice that way. And then once you've sung it through twice, wait... And then choir, you can sing in two parts with 
whichever side you want, okay? <laughs> and then we'll then wait. When you finish it twice, wait. And then we're going to sing it in three parts, starting over here. One, two, three. And we'll sing it through three times when we do it in three parts. <laughs> so you're going to sing it once. And then you're going to wait till you see them sing it. Then we're going to do it in two parts twice. And we're going to do it in three parts three times. <laughs> So who's going to join the choir now? <coughs> Boy, I'm feeling it now. God's here. You and I are here. It's all good. Uh, continuing with the uh, exploration of the ancient sacred text, uh, this morning's gospel reading, to put it into context, it would be helpful to have read the entire 18th chapter of Matthew. If you didn't happen to have done this before you came here this morning, here's a summary, quick summary of the messages in the entire 18th chapter. The first five verses delivers a message uh, to would-be leaders in the community that they are to be humble and teachable as children. Next, in verses 6 to 9, Jesus' followers must attend to matters of personal morality so they don't become stumbling blocks in the paths of others. And third, the faithful disciples cultivate care for one another, is instructed in verses 10 to 14, in the same manner that Paul writes to the Romans that Elizabeth read to us earlier, where Paul says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. And today's reading uh, has a message dealing with resolving situations involving conflict, and we'll get into that a little later. And then after today's reading, if you completed the reading of Matthew chapter 18, you would get a message of be prepared to offer forgiveness to one another, 70 times 7 if necessary. So let's take a look at this reading, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. If another member of the church sins against you, this is, this is Jesus speaking. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you've regained that one. 
But if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the, if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Gospel. I speak to you in the name of the one who challenges us to live a new way. My theme this morning is, is family, and I want to talk about that. Maybe I'll point out to you, which I didn't earlier, I, I chose a quote of the week for you. It's in your bulletin, and it says, we must recognize that we are part of one group, one family, the human family. Our survival as a planet depends on it. We are part of one family, and we are fundamentally good. Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Families come in many configurations. My sons grew up in what many considered a normal, quote, air quotes there, family. In fact, their mother and I used to joke about it, calling ourselves Mr. and Mrs. Normal. In fact, uh, I was a husband and father who earned an honest living working long hours, most of the time out of town, in the oil and gas industry. I was married to a stay-at-home mom who cooked, cleaned house, did the laundry, and nurtured our two sons, who took swimming lessons, went to Cubs and Scouts, and eventually joined organized sports, one son playing hockey, the other high school football and wrestling. This so-called normal family lived in a three-bedroom bungalow with a two-car detached garage in a suburban bedroom community 15 miles from the major city where I worked. We had three dogs for a while, so maybe that part wasn't exactly normal. That's the family my sons grew up in. I grew up in a blended family, although we didn't know it, it really. I, I'm the youngest of five children. My three older sisters are a product of my dad's first marriage. My brother and I came from our dad's second marriage. Our older sisters were teenagers when my brother and I were little boys, and they just loved us to bits. Still do, by the way. Although we knew that we had the same dad and different moms, we never considered ourselves half-siblings. Just five kids, three girls and two boys. There are many families where the parents have divorced and the children live with one parent or the other, some sort of shared custody, arrange, custody arrangement. There are families with two moms and no dad, or two dads and no mom, lots of single parent families, families with adopted children, foster families, families where the grandparents take on the role of parents. And then there are extended families and multiple families. My wife Peggy and I are both in our second marriage, so we have lots of families. Families of origin, of course, and then the families that we became part of during our first and second marriages. My first marriage brought two sons into my family. Peggy's brought a daughter. And now between us, we have three children and seven grandchildren. Not to mention the myriad in-laws from our current and previous marriages. The circle draws wider. We have other families that we don't always think of as families, but consider this. If you ever worked at a job where you worked closely with your coworkers, you may have developed some friendships. Some of the friendships grew into something deeper, and some didn't. 
You grew closer to some of these people and as you became more comfortable with them and they with you, you learned about each other's families, about each other's lives away from work, about each other's hopes and dreams and even fears. The more you learned about each other, the closer the relationships grew and before you knew it, you were family. The circle draws wider. If it didn't happen for you at work, it might have happened somewhere else. I spent 17 years as a member of an organization called Toastmasters. I made some amazing and lasting friendships there. And some of those people are like family to me to this day. We care for each other. We have each other's back. And we sometimes disagree with each other, just like family. The circle draws wider still. And of course, we can't leave out this very special family, our faith family. Sometimes we call it a community of faith, but it's really a family, isn't it? It's a fairly large family. In fact, we don't even all know each other yet. Some of us have been in this family longer than others. Some have developed close friendships. For others, it's more like casual acquaintances. Like all families, we don't always agree with each other. A number of years ago, Lakeview United Church declared itself to be an affirming church. This means that we have publicly declared our commitment to inclusion and justice for all people, including people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. This was in response to social changes that were and still are taking place. It was one more step along our growth journey. Although we all believed in the, it seems like to my memory anyway, that we all believed in the concept of being welcoming and inclusive, we didn't all agree that a formal process was necessary. Well, Daryl Sidor tried to lead us through a process of learning more about what being an affirming congregation means, several of you asked, why are we even doing this? Aren't we already welcoming and inclusive? Fair question. Other people saw value in the exercise. If there's one thing we can be sure of in the era of rapid social changes that affect church life, it is that conflicts will arise. The question is how will we deal with it? Sometimes we argue. Sometimes we find it difficult to get along. And when that happens, because we are a faith family and we know that God is always with us, we never stop loving each other. We find our way through it. And because it's a faith family, I'd be willing to bet that if any one of us needed help, this family would be there for us. Jesus talks about conflict in today's gospel reading. He uses church to make his point, but it could apply to any family or group of people with a common purpose, like work or a volunteer organization or your own family. In today's passage, Jesus gives us step-by-step -step instructions on how to deal with conflict. First, he says, when you feel someone has wronged you, begin by going to the one you're having a problem with and talk it out. Let the other person know why you feel wronged or hurt. You know, one, one of the reasons my first marriage didn't work out is that we didn't talk things out. We both said, well, he or she should know this or that about me and my expectations. In Jesus' example of the church, he suggests that if the problem can't be resolved one-on-one, -on -one, we may need to bring in a neutral third party. And if that doesn't help solve the problem, we may need to involve the wider body. There was a mom who was having an argument with her teenaged daughter over curfew. Mom says, you missed curfew again, you're grounded. Daughter replies, you never trust me, I hate you. Runs to her room and slams the door. A neutral third party who can remain calm might have been able to discover the real problem and when that happens, a solution can become evident. In this example, the teenager 
is transitioning from childhood through adolescence and hoping to reach adulthood. She doesn't feel like her mom trusts her to grow up. Mom, on the other hand, fears for her daughter's safety. I can just hear her saying, I didn't know where you were. You could have been in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> mom and daughter eventually came to understand each other's needs. Mom thought the daughter wanted to just run wild with her friends when what she really needed was to feel trusted and treated less like a child. The daughter thought that mom didn't trust her, wanted to keep her a child forever and punish her for growing up, when what mom really needed was to know her daughter was safe. Once they understood this, they came up with a plan that could work for both of them. Returning to the gospel reason, reading, after Jesus has given his advice on conflict resolution, he kind of shifts gears and offers words of assurance. And he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. We sometimes use this passage to console ourselves over poor attendance at a church meeting. <laughs> as long as there's two or three of us here. But I find it helpful to remind myself of this truth when I'm trying to resolve a conflict. Imagine I'm, I'm in a situation of conflict or argument or try and debate some, some matter, whether it's with a family member or a church family member or something. How I would conduct myself in that conversation if I reminded myself, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, I am there. Would how would it be if I really knew and felt and believed that Jesus was sitting at that table too? And guess what? He is. Before we sing our responding hymn, let's remind ourselves what Archbishop Desmond Tutu said in the quote I chose for you today. We must recognize that we are part of one group, one family, the human family. Our survival as a planet depends on it. We are part of one family, and we are fundamentally good. Amen. We're going to stand for this one, I'm sure.
We'll now receive the, the offering as it's been brought forward, and I'll pray, pray or we'll pray, pray together a blessing on it. It's printed in there, isn't it, right? So I don't have it here, so. Peggy, can you read that? I, can't, I don't have it here. Oh, it's God. Return to you a portion of all you have generously given us. Even as we give, let seek you and your blessing. Take us and you these gifts, and cause them and them to be a blessing to others. We ask this in love and in Jesus' name. Amen.
Before we uh, go to the next portion of the program, I, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements that just might have got missed at the beginning. One, you know we're, we're putting together a, a church directory and so many of you are going to get your photos taken to go in that and uh, just a reminder that that's this week coming up so you, you know what time you're supposed to come so just remember that. Also, um, we do have coffee today so please stay afterwards for coffee and, and some good conversation. And now let us attend to the work and privilege of prayer. Today's prayer, I, I will say in, in segments, and after each segment or portion, when I say the words, gracious God, hear our prayer, you will respond by singing. And let's try that now. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Creator God, who has created our world and everything in it, we come to you today in sincere prayer, opening our hearts to you. We pray that you will accept our praise and our gratitude for all that you have provided. You have given us a safe and supportive church family with which to worship and form a community. You have given each one of us special gifts that we can use to help make this world a better place. For some, it's a gift of music. For some, compassion and understanding. For others, wisdom, courage, humor, creativity, athleticism, so many gifts. One of the most precious is the gift of family. For many of us, family represents love, stability, support, and encouragement. Help us, God, to remember that there are people whose family life represents conflict, dysfunction, fear, and pain. We pray for those whose family life is difficult. May we support and not judge them. We pray for those whose family has become estranged. May they find a loving family in a church home, a workplace, a club, or organization they could join. Let your spirit guide them to where they need to be, and may that same spirit guide us to help where we can. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Even as we prayerfully express our gratitude for the abundant life you have provided, giving thanks for good food to eat, a comfortable bed to sleep in, and family to share our lives with, we pray for those who will sleep in a shelter tonight, in an encampment or on the street. We pray for the people who will go hungry tonight, and for those who are lonely and afraid. Gracious God, hear our prayer.
We pray for victims of natural disasters everywhere, and this weekend especially, we pray for earthquake victims in Morocco. May those who survived find support in what must be unbearable grief. We offer a prayer of thanks for the people returning to Yellowknife, Shuswap, and other places after being evacuated from their homes due to wildfires. May they be able to rebuild their lives. Locally, we pray for the children and their families who have been affected by the recent E. coli outbreak. And we pray for all those who are ill, lonely, sad, or afraid. We pray for the health care providers and first responders who have dedicated their lives to our well-being. Gracious God, hear our prayer. God, each of us knows someone who is ill, lonely, afraid, or grieving. Each of us has something very personal to be thankful for. We lift our most personal prayers up to you directly from our hearts in silence. Gracious God, hear our prayer. And now we join together as a family, praying with Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The light has accompanied us in this sacred hour, and now the light has changed from a flame to an essence. As the light changes, so will we. We will be changed and we will seek change and we will change the world around us. Let us take the essence of light into our lives. Please stand for our closing hymn.
before I send you on your way, I, I just want to uh, remember to say thank you to Cody and the choir for their gift of music and how great that was. Thank you to Silas and Don for the, uh, although they didn't have the slides, they're busy working up there recording this so that people can watch it at home. And thank you to, especially to you, for allowing me to worship with you in this very special way. And now as you leave this place, take with you the love of the God who made you, Jesus who came for you, and the Spirit who will never leave you. Go in peace. Thank you.